Well, we're going to start uh, our next presentation, and we're very happy again to, to make sure that, um, that we're addressing the markets that really make up the population in, in, of this great school. So uh, LGBT was, uh, was, we thought, was, was not only um, uh, uh, an uh, opportunity to uh, highlight some of the students here, but it's a great market. It's a new market, and it's very exciting, especially here in the Twin Cities. So to introduce our, our next presenter, we've got um, our friend, uh, uh, a member here at uh, Metropolitan State University, Sydney Gardner, and she's working in the, in the Gender and Sexuality Student Services. So let's, uh, let's have a hand for Sydney, who will introduce our presenter. Sydney. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm very, very excited to be here today and to see all of you out here and to also be talking about this important issue as a member of the community and as somebody who works here with LGBT and women's populations. It's so critical that we're having these conversations and really taking a look at this market. So I'm very excited again to introduce Christine <coughs> Layton. Um, she's award-winning marketer and founder of Astro Group, a full-service branding agency. Chris and her team handle strategy, brand ex experience design, and consumer engagement programs for leading brands. Her work is focused on transforming consumer to brand relationships through a deep understanding of culture, market dynamics, and trends. Chris brings considerable expertise engaging LGBT, LOHAS, millennial, and women consumers. She has led transformative LGBT research, marketing strategy, and advertising for a host of companies, including AAA, MyPartner.com, Olivia, and WAMU. She regularly travels and presents new insights on creating effective and engaging campaigns and long-term relationships with consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. I'm just going to do a little check, check, check. Are we good here? OK. Um, well, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I think this format at Metropolitan is amazing. You guys are so ex uh, uh, lucky to have it. And I really wanted to thank Rick Aguilar as well. So this is a great format. Uh, before I get started, just a couple of things. Um, I'm a big social media buff, so if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd love to take a photo of you good-looking people so I can post this later on, if that's okay. So everyone smile. A little wave for me, please. Hello. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> that will be posted later. Okay. So thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's get started here. So today we're going to talk about markets, trends, and opportunities with LGBT uh, customers. Um, <clears throat> actually, two more quick disclaimers. One. We just had one of those famous uh, Mac PC transitions in, a moment ago, so I noticed all my bullets don't look as pretty as they looked yesterday. Uh, but, th but that's okay, you can go, get over that. The other thing is um, I'm notorious for having at least one typo in every presentation, no matter how hard my team and I try. So if you find the typo, uh, and it doesn't count for um, capitalization, if you find it, raise your hand. I've got, I've got a candy for you here, so you can find that. Okay, so today, um, the goal of today's presentation is to really um, take an overview look and help develop a deeper understanding of U.S. lesbian and gay consumers. So what I'd like to do is do a little bit of uh, what I call Gay 101, just a little level setting of the segment, a bit about the size, some perspectives that we have, uh, and um, just some opportunities and things we should be thinking about right now in this um, in this uh, uh, environment where lesbians and gays are a hot topic in, in politics and other things. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about just um, some of what's happening um, from a society point of view so you can understand sort of uh, where, where things are um, politically certainly and just some laws and things. Um, what, one of the things I want to do today is, is really shed some light and hopefully help you appreciate some of the experiences that separate LGBT from the mainstream audience uh, or, or uh, general markets. And um, this is a multicultural marketing co uh, conference, so guiding strategic marketing and advertising is also paramount. So just one other quick note about the nomenclature that I use in this. I use the terms uh, lesbian, gay, LGBT interchangeably through this, um, through this presentation. Okay, all right, ready to go? All right, woohoo! 
Okay, oh, a little bit about Asterix. Well, you know about me, because uh, uh, Sydney just introduced me. But founded Asterix Group in 2002, San Francisco, LGBT owned. Uh, we work with clients all over the US, Canada, and Latin America. Uh, we do a lot of general market work, but one of the reasons that uh, people call us is for our LGBT specialty, which is helping general market companies uh, understand and develop strategies to build relationships with LGBT audiences. I want to make that very clear. We're not a gay advertising agency. We try to help companies build relationships with LGBT audiences, and relationship building starts with understanding who they are. Uh, and then certainly we work with some um, what would be called gay companies, um, which primarily serve the gay community. So, okay, so I uh, guess you can see all this. Okay, that's a dense slide, but I'm just going to break it down for you. So LGBT T consumers uh, make up roughly 10% of the U.S. consumer market. And there's a little asterisk there, not to reinforce the name of our company, but to, to just let you know that that number is a very difficult number to quantify. Um, and why is that? There are two primary reasons. The first reason is that unlike um, other ethnic groups, if you're born Hispanic, you know you're Hispanic. LGBT people have something called coming out. And therefore, not everyone has raised their hand as an out LGBT adult, and so we can't count them. <laughs> Some of you are raising your hands right now, which is great. So raise your hand if you're in this 10%. All right, all right, me too. <clears throat> the other reason that it's, it's very tough to quantify is because of US Census data. Although in 2000, it was the first time that the US Census started to ask a question which we could uh, start to extrapolate some numbers for size and then uh, the past census as well. It's not exact. So um, there's not a question that asks, are you lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender on the census now? So roughly about 10%. And we know that in terms of um, buying power, LGBT tend to own more homes, cars, certainly travel a lot more and spend more on electronics. And they have a large amount of disposable income per capita. It's larger than any other niche markets. And that doesn't necessarily mean because we're all making a lot more money. It generally means that there are tend to be two adults in the household if you're in a couple, and they tend to have less, we tend to have less children at home, which means we have more uh, money to spend on things that are not kiddo related, okay? So total buying power of the uh, adult US LGBT population is projected at 743 billion. Uh, this number has gone up and down, um, uh, especially with the, the economic downturn. But essentially, the buying power itself is commensurate with uh, African American and, and Latino combined. Although we know that 10% is a sliver of the economy. So it's a lot of buying power. Again, often due to dual household incomes. Um, and it's uh, well over the national average in terms of um, income, over 250,000 a year, and also household incomes of 100,000 or more. Okay, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of money there, and that makes us very attractive to marketers. Um, one of the, um, the sort of um, hallmarks of lesbian and gay consumers is that we tend to be an extremely brand loyal segment. 71% of lesbians and gays said that they would be likely to remain loyal to a brand that they believe is very friendly, and keyword here, supportive of the LGBT community and issues, even if it costs more or if it's less convenient. And one of the other things that we're noting right now uh, is that its um, LGBT segment is listening and they're watching right now to see where companies and cities and politicians fall in terms of support. And believe me, there's a very big difference between what was first coined gay friendly and gay inclusive and gay supportive. So there's kind of a wide variety. We're gonna show you a couple case studies uh, to talk about that. And also just to mention, um, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, um, uh, some of the research in this um, presentation, which you have in your CD in your bag, um, much of it is based on a study uh, that Asterix Group and New American Dimensions, you'll hear from David Morris later today, um, commissioned uh, on our own. And then I've peppered it in with some other recent stats in there. Um, and it's important to understand that why did we go and do our own study? Well, because there's, there's not a lot of, of uh, definitive uh, studying being done on LGBT consumers, so we had to go out and do it ourselves. Uh, 
87% of LGBT adults and 75% of non-LGBT say they are likely to consider a brand that is known to provide equal workplace benefits. In fact, in the studies uh, that we've done, New American Dimensions and Asterix Group, <coughs> the number one uh, uh, thing, if you will, action that um, a company can take to prove to an LGBT consumer that they are on their side is to provide uh, workplace benefits for same-sex partners. So, and then that sort of falls into choosing health insurance as well, where 82% say it's important that a health insurance carrier provide domestic partnership coverage, whether they're on that plan or not. So just a little bit about some of the social dynamics that are happening now. Um, I will certainly say that um, the LGBT uh, environment is, um, you know, discussions are a lot more active than they were, say, even 10 years ago. One of the reasons is because a little thing in the media called Ellen DeGeneres when she came out on national television, and that was uh, over 10 years ago now. So in terms of what is really influencing and making impacts on the American landscape, let's talk about media for a second. Well, certainly Ellen uh, now, so um, she has one of the top rated television shows and daytime television. We've got shows like Modern Family and Glee, all with uh, gay characters, and films uh, like The Kids Are All Right, where straight actors are doing a really good job playing lesbian characters, I think. Um, <laughs> socially, <coughs> we're talking about what's happening legally and social on the social landscape. Gay marriage is legal right now in six states. I say six plus because some are sort of on the fence, right? So California, some have been married, including me, and it's been grandfathered in until the state figures out where, what direction they're going to go. Um, there's also a huge trend right now in what we're calling and following and tracking as the gay baby boom. So same-sex uh, partners uh, having or adopting children. So it's a really big thing. And that has huge impacts in terms of schools and um, just socialization of, of kids, et cetera. So, of course, the release of uh, recent census data uh, and how we're tracking LGBT. Legally, um, there are new IRS and state tax laws to deal with, especially for same-sex couples who are legally married in a state but aren't federally recognized. I'm telling you that my uh, accountant had a heyday with my taxes two years ago um, because it's, it's a complicated mess. Um, also, some legal things that have happened is passing of the Matthew Shepard Act, which is uh, the uh, Federal um, Hate Crimes Act, so that's at a national level. That happened about two years ago. Uh, and of course, uh, ending of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That was a huge um, thing happening legally. Um, and then uh, there are other issues that are still uh, at play, like the Defense of Marriage Act. All of these things are important because we're basically talking about LGBT people. Uh, corporate, we have an increasing support of inclusion of LGBT employees uh, and an increase in outreach. Um, and something that we're calling um, sticking their neck out. Companies that are deciding to stick their neck out in support of LGBT issues, things like marriage, things like domestic partnerships, uh, benefits rather, even if that means they're going to get uh, ha experience some backlash. Starbucks recently uh, came out on the side of, of marriage, and J.C. Penney, of course, has had a, a campaign where they hired um, Ellen DeGeneres as their spokeswoman, and they received some backlash. <clears throat> At the same time that all of that is happening, and LGBT people are becoming more visible, and the conversation is becoming more and more about us, um, it is still legal in 29 states to fire someone for being lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And it is still legal in 34 states to fire an employee for being transgender. So there's a lot, uh, a long way to go. Okay. Let's see, did that click? I clicked it. Let's go. All right. So <clears throat> all of that and, of course, the hand raisers, people who self-identify as gay, uh, that's one of the reasons that we're one of the fastest growing and most recognized uh, U.S. market segments. And really, there was sort of what I call a gay marketing boom, which started in the early 90s. Uh, but since that time, uh, we've seen some maturing of that market. So we're talking about a segment that's powerful, that's very brand conscious, that tends to be early adopters of uh, internet behavior, social media, and technology. Uh, and because of that early adoption, they tend to be influential uh, and, and trendsetters. 
So um, it's a segment that includes gay men and lesbians, of course, and distinct personas within each. Uh, and just like there's no single Asian market, as we just learned from Saul, there's no single LGBT market, and we're going to talk about that in a few slides. Um, and one other thing that uh, gay does not necessarily equal lesbian, uh, because there are a lot of gender differences as well. So it makes it a big complicated uh, segment to track. <clears throat> and again, because we typically have higher disposable incomes, um, we tend to be more resilient consumers. So our um, spending on um, things like entertainment and going out to dinner, et cetera, through this economic downturn t uh, stayed a bit more steady than the general market. Okay, so we spend more freely, we spend on ourselves, because like I said, there aren't a lot of kiddos at home and um, spending through tough economies. And generally speaking, um, the LGBT segment tends to be educated, very brand loyal, as I mentioned before, committed consumers, leading full out and open lives. There is a, a trend towards, um, and I'll, I'll share that on a slide in a moment, towards um, saying I am out and I'm completely fine with that, I'm not in the closet anymore, and then purchasing high quality and products and services. So this, um, I love this, I'm going to have to read it up here for a second, but this is a quote from, uh, let's see, uh, a state senator in Mississippi after the 2000 um, census uh, where he, uh, someone came and told him that there were 55 uh, gay people in his hometown, and he said, surely you jest. I have never met any of these people. So um, one of the things that we know is that um, as um, uh, straight Americans uh, tend to meet more and more LGBT Americans, uh, they realize that uh, everything is okay. In fact, we're present in 99.3% of, uh, of counties in the U.S. Um, and it's a demographic, of course, that crosses over of obviously both genders and across ethnic lines. So um, the tend toward marriage and forming families and doing all of this in the suburbs is also a trend that we're following. So uh, it used to be San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, but now um, one of the um, top um, uh, areas of density for lesbians is Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> and we've got places like Berkeley and, and other suburbs, so there's a, there's a trend there. Um, and this was from our study um, when we talked to um, lesbians and gays about um, values. Those with children said, my family is the most important thing in my life. So that's something from what I would call the, the gay family value segment. So in terms of increasing invisibility, oftentimes, as you know, marketers tend to do sort of a, a wide uh, general market approach. But let's just take a look at some of the women um, in the who are in um, our purview now who identify with the LGBT segment. Let's see if anyone can name all of these women. <laughs> all right, so we have Lily Tomlin. I won't go in any particular order. Rachel Maddow on the left, Kate Clinton. Of course, we have Ellen and her lovely wife, Portia de Rossi. Um, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, Meredith Baxter. Uh, we've got the out uh, country singer, country western singer, Shelly, does anyone know her last name? Shelly? Shelly Wright. Shelly Wright. Suzanne Westenhofer and Cheryl Swoops, who's a WNBA player. Okay. And then let's not forget about the guys. <clears throat> okay. Lieutenant Troy, who's one of the, the first outed um, uh, um, Army, guys, okay, we've got, uh, now I'm drawing a blank again. What's it, Ricky Martin, thank you. Um, American Idol, let's see who else. Thank you, Adam Lambert. D d I still say Doogie Howser um, every time I see that, which is aging me. Okay, Elton John and his husband, David Furnish. Who else, who else is here? The, the richest LGBT executive, the CEO of Apple, you guys know who that is? And of course, one of my favorites, Don Lemon on the CNN anchor. Uh, yeah. Of the top right, uh, the, the former CEO of the, um, let's see, thank you, Phoenix, I'm like basketball, basketball, which, which one? So again, really 99.3% of all counties in the U.S. and we're everywhere, so just, just a couple of reminders, okay. Oh, of course, in our leader, Lady Gaga, which the President <laughs> of the United States likes to call her the leader of our people, Lady Gaga, right? Okay, 
<clears throat> okay, so <laughs> just as Saul said earlier, there's no single Asian market and there's no single gay market. Uh, in fact, uh, gays and lesbians form a community of distinct segments that together represent a broader dynamic um, a uh, group with lots of various sensitivities, preferences, um, and attitudes and behaviors. Um, that's one of the things that we found so interesting from, from, our, from our study. Um, in fact, I wanna just put this up for a second. Can you guys see that okay? It's a little bit bright on my screen. So <clears throat> in the study that um, Asterix and New American Dimensions did, we actually identified um, uh, five distinct segments, and I'm just gonna describe each of them, and th this is the names we gave to them. Uh, closeted, what we call habitaters, the gay mainstream, party people, and a term we made up that's now all over the internet, all over the internet, in fact on t-shirts called super gays. Uh, and we were able to segment um, these groups by um, their wish statements. So closeted, which represents 12%, of course tend to be um, the gays and lesbians that are still in the closet, they, their wish statement is they really wish to uh, lead an honest life, not a double life. And the habitaters are an interesting group, that's about 25%. And these are the folks that really wish to be out and with their family. So these are the folks that are married, they have kids, they probably live in your neighborhood, they have children that go to school with your kids, so they're all about forming families. Um, the gay mainstream, which is a very interesting group, we found uh, about 23% of LGBT who self-identify as kind of trying to blend in. So they've got maybe one foot in the closet, but one foot out um, as habitaters, but they tend to behave more uh, like um, more of, more of a, a straight segment. Uh, the party people who we love, I think we've all been there as party people, especially in college, 14%. These are the folks that say, I'm just here to party and I'm here for myself and I'm out and respect me for that. Well, what happens with party people is that we notice that most uh, advertising that's directed at uh, the LGBT segment is directed at party people. But they don't have all the money, so they should be going to folks like the super gays <laughs> and the habitaters. We have the money. So the super gays are the folks, 26%, that are the loudest and the outest and the proudest. Uh, they're the ones who will give the most money uh, who, who will, um, uh, to causes and they'll, they'll spend the most time um, fighting for LGBT causes. So this slide is hard to read on the screen, but it's broken down and it's in more detail uh, on your CD. But it gives you some more interesting um, sort of tidbits about how um, the segment um, the, the persona is basically within the segment. So again, habitaters, party people, super gays, the highest in outness uh, and the highest in perceived discrimination. Um, and the closeted folks, they're almost completely in the closet uh, and so they wish that they could be out of gay mainstream and habitaters, okay? Kind of interesting stuff. All right, so going a little bit deeper, uh, as we looked at all of those segments, or, 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 or uh, slices within the segment, all the personas, with the exception of the closeted folks, today's lesbians and gays tend to be open and honest about their sexual orientation and consider that an integral part of who they are. In fact, two-thirds agree, everyone knows I'm gay, and 60% say I'm completely fine with that. Again, 10, 15 years ago, that wouldn't have been the same. Um, over 70% say that being gay is an important part of who I am. Um, age is a large factor in how this manifests. Um, 18 to 24 year olds have the highest degree of outness. And uh, one of the trends that we're noticing is that um, uh, uh, LGBT are identifying uh, as uh, LGBT earlier. The average age of identification is 15 years old. And so growing up um, in a society where it's becoming uh, less of a taboo, um, they're coming out earlier and with the highest degree of outness. On the other hand, um, older uh, parts of the segment are also just coming out of the closet and staying out of the closet where they didn't feel comfortable to do that years ago. And then we took a look at stereotypes and discrimination. And this has been, of course, a hot topic when you think about the epidemic of bullying. 
um, that's been happening in schools, and it's not just LGBT youth, it's, it's um, bullying in general. Um, but one of the things that we noticed was that nearly two-thirds of gays and lesbians reported in our study experiencing stereotyping and discrimination. <clears throat> this feeling, which was interesting, was particularly prevalent among Caucasians over um, African American and Latinos that we, we talked to. And that might be because um, they feel more sensitive about that because they hadn't been discriminated or haven't felt the feeling of discrimination based on their ethnicity. So, and also nearly two, uh, three quarters rather of gays and lesbians say they feel safer in a quote unquote gay neighborhood. So safety is a, is a really um, prevalent issue, especially for lesbians um, who feel um, unsafe uh, with things like traveling and vacations if they're outside of their sort of normal uh, neighborhood and stuff. So something to, to think about. Click, ah, all right, there it is. There's the second click, so uh, that's what I just said. <laughs> it's happening at every age, especially uh, with the ep epidemic of bullying that we've seen. Hello. Is it going? Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay, let me go back one to make sure I didn't lose it. Okay. All right. And then we um, asked about what are you doing with all this high level of discretionary income that you have and are you investing it? So um, we work with a lot of financial services companies and we wanted to understand a bit more about how LGBT Americans are investing their money. So it's higher than um, the general market in terms of um, savings and investing, where 40% invest in stocks, 36% uh, money market funds, et cetera, 25% use financial planning services. And in focus groups that we do, uh, we often hear that the financial planning aspect is of a higher concern for LGBT uh, long-term committed and married uh, couples uh, because there's, there's less legal um, benefits and assurances that they'll be able to pass uh, their wealth along to their partner, so the financial planning becomes sort of a high priority. Uh, and of course, um, besides the investment, spending on things they enjoy. 65% um, identify as having to have the latest. Again, that's very attractive to marketers who want to um, sell new things like iPods and iPads to them. 68% have to upgrade to the latest latest model, and 77% believe in indulging themselves. All right. <laughs> okay. And then we wanted to um, take a look at support for advocates. And advocates kind of come into two areas. One is um, uh, general market companies that support uh, the LGBT community, uh, and also um, charities um, and groups like the Human Rights Campaign and GLAAD and, and things like that. So 60% indicate that they actively support the gay community with their time or money. So um, the, the, the volunteer rate is very high in this, as well as the check writers. 81%, um, this is a huge number, are more likely to buy for a company if it markets directly to them. Very, very high. So um, that's something that is, um, it's a challenge for marketers because there are fewer, um, uh, places, media outlets, where we can advertise directly uh, to the segment. Things like um, local papers and magazines and online, things like that. And then, of course, nearly 70% prefer TV that, in, that includes a gay character, but really, who doesn't, right? So um, it's a fun part of the storyline in shows like Glee, etc. cetera. Uh, and the implication of all of this is that LGBT communities are uh, are trendsetters with the ability to help a marketer uh, introduce new products and make or break uh, the, the bottom line there. Okay, so here are some of the, the lifestyle trends that we are following. Um, every year, uh, my team and I, we sit down and we take a look at, you know, what are the top trends? Uh, what are the things that, um, sort of based on the social dynamics that continue to affect us? So these are the top um, six things that we're following. Usually we have five, we added a sixth. So uh, the number one thing is we're following is the trend of uh, what I call um, gay family values. So that is about marriage increasing, and that certainly is increasing with legalization across states. <clears throat> um, an increase in, in stay-at-home parents and a sincere commitment by one of the parents to leave the workplace in order to raise the children. I know for a fact that several, that's the situation with several of my friends 
uh, and, it, and it's really exciting to see. A second trend that we're following is what we're calling the graying of the gays. Uh, so of course the out population is getting uh, older in line with the rest of America, but it has very specific implications if you've uh, lived with your um, same-sex partner for 20, 30, 40 years or more, and now your options may be limited to you, depending on where you live, uh, for retirement home and community. So it's starting to become a trend that we're watching um, um, uh, retirement facilities um, have to address this and how to keep the couple together, especially in states that are not supportive. Um, digital and social media savvy. Uh, we know that um, the digital trends, behaviors, gadgets that has been high for a long time with LGBT and continues to be high. Um, one of the most fascinating things, um, and recently we were talking to some folks over at American Express about this, is what we call the entrepreneurial edge. 12% of um, LGBT communities are self-employed. So they're, they're business owners or consultants and uh, that's double the US average, which is 6% overall. Style and design fanatics, um, choose brands by name, play up design in the community aspect of that, which is true. Um, and then the sixth thing, which is, this is the Mac PC issue. Oh, has anyone found a typo yet? No, okay, all right. Um, travel extensive and frequently. Um, the, 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 the travel numbers for LGBT and the spending is staggering. And it has been for some time. 55 billion in travel spending, which is off the charts um, from the general market. So the frequency in trips, um, the level of stays, uh, um, et cetera. So that's, if you're a travel marketer, we can do a whole presentation just on that. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Okay, and just a couple quick things on values and then I'm gonna share a couple of um, examples of some advertising with you and then and we'll, we'll move on to some questions. Um, in terms of values, again, in our study we found that gays are more likely to agree with statements like I'm a natural leader, I'm influenced by what's hot and by what's not. Um, uh, no surprise that uh, gays and lesbians are more likely to be politically and civically, civil, civically involved. And that's not a surprise, especially um, when a lot of the uh, political climate has, uh, has to do with issues that affect our lives. So 79% voted in the last federal, state, or local election. 92% uh, voted in the last presidential election, et cetera, and it continues to be high on that. Okay, and then um, before I talk about some of the current marketing, um, just wanted to mention a couple of what we call the um, pioneer uh, gay brands or, or gay iconic brands. And some, I can see some smiles out there. Um, one of the brands I just wanted to mention, because uh, I think they're really fun, it indicates the travel segment. Um, but Olivia, who's heard of Olivia? Does anyone here heard? Okay, all right. So for those of you who don't know, um, Olivia is a lesbian travel company, and they were founded uh, over 35 years ago as a record label. Um, and over the years, they evolved into travel um, and, and other things, and they have staggering numbers about how many women have gone on Olivia cruises or on, on an Olivia resort. So it's just an iconic and, and favorite brand in the, in the women's community for sure. Um, Absolute, um, of course, is known for being uh, way out front on lots of things. Um, Absolute has done a lot of spending with the community um, from, from the early days of the gay marketing boom. Uh, and a lot of that spending had to do with giving away a lot of free product at events uh, and things like that and showing up at, at events and, and parties. And what it did was it caused a lot of other vodka brands to come in the wake and say, I want a part of that share of the absolute pride dollars. Subaru is a very interesting um, case study, but several years ago, um, through word of mouth, <laughs> Lesbians started um, buying a lot of Subarus and asking their friends what kind of car you buy because it fit their lifestyle perfectly about being outdoors and rugged and uh, throw two dogs in the back. Um, and about t mm, 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, uh, one of, um, they brought in a new VP of marketing and, and he was looking and saying, what is this? What is this, there are these pockets where a Subaru um, purchasing is, is like astronomical with women, and what is that all about? Without doing any marketing to um, lesbians in particular, at the time, they, um, 
were still becoming these great brand fans. And so since they found some of that out, they went and they started dedicating some marketing dollars to them. Uh, and it's been sort of a fun story to track. And Martina Navratilova was a spokeswoman for them for a while. All right. <clears throat> okay, let's see if I can read this slide here. <clears throat> okay, so this is a very sort of interesting slide to me. This actually is a, is a stat that just came out from, a, from another marketing firm called Community Marketing in, in California. And it's interesting because it, it follows a trend that we're seeing in focus groups. Mainstream ads that are LGBT inclusive are earning the respect and attention of LGBT consumers. So as, as a brand and advertising marketer, the biggest shift that I've seen in responses um, in focus groups with LGBT um, folks is a few years ago what we would hear when we said, How, what's the best way a general market company can reach out to me? We used to hear almost everyone say, advertise to me in my publications. Well, that has really shifted to what we're following is um, advertise to me and show me as, as part of the diverse landscape in your general market ads. So that's one of the biggest nuggets. And then this study from Community Marketing really backed that up. And I'm trying to read what that LGBT inclusive mainstream media is the fourth thing that uh, marketers can do. So show me as part of a diverse USA. <clears throat> OK. So let's talk a little bit. I've got, I think, three examples I want to share with you. And how am I on time? OK, good. Let's talk about JCPenney for a minute. Anyone know the story of JCPenney, what they've been going through lately? OK. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, in early, uh, earlier this year, JCPenney uh, was doing a rebranding. And as part of that rebranding, they hired Ellen DeGeneres to be the company's spokeswoman, which I thought was pretty a great move. Um, but that prompted outrage and backlash from the one million moms. And I want to read you this quote, because this is their, their quote that they went out um, to, to raise signatures. And <clears throat> they said, JCPenney thinks hiring an open homosexual spokesperson will help their business when most of their com customers are traditional families. DeGeneres is not a true representation of the type of families that also shop at their store, and the majority of JCPenney shoppers will be offended and choose to no longer shop there. All right, but that's not what happened at all. <laughs> Instead, what happened is over 22,000 people signed a petition to thank the retailer for their pro-gay stance and for not putting their head in the sand and firing DeGeneres for no reason. <clears throat> in February this year, uh, there was a pink dollar flash mob. Did anyone hear about the pink dollar flash mob? All right, this was really fun. So shoppers all over the internet and all over JCPenney retailers supported the brand at precisely, I'm going to say, 3 o'clock on a Saturday, and everyone flooded in with their pink t-shirts on. <clears throat> Social media had a firestorm with the hashtag, especially on Twitter, stand up for Ellen, and it caused a great discussion uh, to support Ellen as a JCPenney spokesperson. In the meantime, uh, Ellen stayed pretty quiet. She said a couple things on her show, but she tried to stay out of the fray while the community took over. So let's see if this is going to play. We're going to try this just, just to, for fun to give you a sense of um, if I click, it should play, right? This was the, the pink flash mob taking over the JCPenney in, in Herald Square. <clears throat> and here they come. And this goes on and on and on and on. But if you can imagine shoppers flooding the JCPenney website to show support for um, the store, and instead of people not spending money at JCPenney, they have a lot of people spending a lot of money at JCPenney and having a pretty good time doing it, too. So it just gives you a little chance of what was there. All right. OK. <clears throat> and then it kept going. So this past Mother's Day, which was just a few weeks ago, um, JCPenney, um, in their Mother's Day ads, um, included a lesbian family and their daughter. There's, um, the, the point of this ad was to show different types of families. So you have an older mom with a daughter. And then on the uh, right side, you have a lesbian family with their daughter. And JCPenney, so proud of them, said, we want to be a store for all Americans. So in celebration of Mother's Day, we're proud that our May book honors women from diverse backgrounds 
who all share the heartwarming experiences of motherhood. So that's just a little bit about what's going on in general market companies supporting LGBT. All right. Uh, let's switch gears to travel for one second. So how many of you know Kimpton Hotels? All right. We're a big fan of Kimpton Hotels. So one of the things that we find when we talk to um, clients is sometimes um, they uh, want to start an LGBT marketing program. And the first thing we say is, well, do you know who your LGBT customers and consumers are? And they say no, because one of the reasons is they just haven't asked them or found the right vehicle to ask them. So a few years ago, um, Kimpton um, has an established in-touch loyalty program, which is um, where their um, uh, customers can sort of self-identify what their interests are. So they use this as an opportunity to ask um, who would be interested in uh, gay and lesbian travel or gay and lesbian promotions. And they also asked, are you interested in pet-friendly programs, earth, earth care, wine, dining? I probably would check off all of these <laughs> on here, uh, except for the Kimpton residences. Uh, but that's how they were able to figure out who the segment was. And they had an overwhelming um, number of self-hand self, uh, raisers. So um, in the first 25 months, it generated over 13,000 LGBT members to, um, to this program. And so what did that allow them to do? Now all of a sudden they've got a, a, a fan base that they can market to. Um, year over year, um, it generates over just the, the LGBT market program an additional $5 million a year, which is probably not a lot, but that's $5 million, I mean, to the whole bottom line, but it's $5 million they wouldn't have had otherwise. And they have a fiercely loyal customer base that stays with them over and over again. So ROI of 35 to 1. So that's pretty good. <clears throat> okay. Uh, two, just two more quick stories. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about a, a marketer. Uh, too bad WAMU doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they were a great client of ours for several years, but um, this is a case study where uh, they were already spending heavily hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing and sponsorship and millions of dollars in advertising just to uh, the LGBT segment. And they were really known as a sort of a trailblazer. But the problem was, despite all this money that they were spending, they weren't getting any credit back from the consumer themselves. They weren't recognizing it. So um, what we did was we went in and took a look at what they were doing, how they were marketing. And what we discovered is that they were spending money on sponsorships and they were spending money on advertising. But they didn't have strategies to actually build a relationship with the consumer. So we went in and we uh, reorganized their um, strategic plan. We actually helped them save some money in the process of doing it. Our focus groups, we ask them, like we do normally, what can um, WAMU do to um, help you understand what they're doing in the market? So we developed a campaign that more specifically spoke to them. So two things we did. I mean, it's hard to see this on here, but on the, the right-hand side, what you'll see was we um, created um, uh, advertise, uh, print advertising and some radio advertising that actually spoke sp uh, separately to uh, gay males and to lesbians. So we actually took the next step and spoke to um, people directly in their language. <clears throat> the next thing we did was we um, did, we sort of added the LGBT message along with the general market message. At this time, the, they just launched the WooHoo campaign. Uh, and so the brand was trying to move um, to more friendly, inclusive, casual. And we said, well, if you want to really reintroduce yourself to um, LGBT Americans, let's go right to their neighborhoods and say hi. <laughs> so we did. We did an outdoor campaign. And we said, welcome to the gayborhood uh, in Castro, in Chelsea, and in, in uh, uh, West Hollywood. Uh, so it was a little inside um, um, fun, friendly discussion, or, or language that we used, and it worked really well, it got them noticed. And then our print ads were things like, finally a bank that's on my side, and then we talked about what WAMU was doing specifically for LGBT Americans. So it was recognized, and the most important thing is that we went from, uh, when we researched it, from low awareness, not even on the radar, to uh, the best bank for gays and lesbians when we repolled 18 months later. All right. Okay, and what I want to do, um, I want to end with um, an example of a major marketer, Google. How many of you heard of Google? <clears throat> and what they're doing. Um, so um, 
Uh, several months ago, Google launched Chrome, their browser, and as part of that, um, they decided for one of the, the first time they were going to run um, television ads. So um, the Google Chrome team, to come up with stories for what those um, ads would be, they wanted to talk about how Chrome helps um, uh, expand uh, the, your life on the web, basically. So they went in and they looked at the people who were actually using Chrome and the suite of Google tools and what they were using it for. And the Google Chrome team came upon um, this story from Dan Savage, and this is what they put together. Uh, he was using it for the It Gets Better campaign. <sighs> okay, let's play this one. <gasps> All right, thank you, Google, for that spot. <laughs> <clears throat> there are so many things I love about that spot, but one of the things that um, I wanted to share with you is how uh, a general market uh, mainstream uh, brand and company was uh, sending a, a great example in their mainstream advertising of, of how we as a company were including LGBT people. And they did it in a way that was honorable and respectful, and not all the people were LGBT, and you saw folks of uh, all kinds of the diversity landscape. So I think they did a great job. Um, Google also does a great job of a very strong um, internal workplace uh, program. They have a great um, ERG, and then of course they continue to advertise uh, and work with Dan Savage in the It Gets Better project. So um, I wanted to show you and share just a few different examples. So it's just a couple concluding thoughts. Uh, just remember that gays and lesbians are fiercely brand loyal, and we're paying attention right now to what companies are doing, what politicians are saying, to see who supports us and puts their neck out. Uh, if you really want to be ad admired by LGBT consumers, your marketing must be relevant, emotive, customized, and as we're finding out, appear in both gay-specific and uh, traditional media, much like um, what we did with WAMU and what Google did. Uh, and a fascinating stat, don't be afraid of marketing the gays and lesbians because 81% of Americans do not care if a company whose products they use also promotes those products to gays. Uh, so that's great news. Uh, and therefore, brands should not be um, uh, fearful about reacting to public sentiment and instead start a dialogue and uh, start building a relationship with lesbians and gays today. Thank you. I'm here to take some questions. We'll have uh, uh, Chris and Sydney here. Uh, we also want to remind you that we're going to have a closing panel at 3.30, so if you, if you have some questions, maybe you think about it during lunch, 3.30, we're going to be here with a whole half hour with all our presenters, and we definitely want you to, uh, to give us some questions and, or maybe some reactions, but uh, we've got a couple minutes here, so anyone? And I have the mic if people. Okay, There's Saul. One for Saul. Yeah. I have a question, I'll just speak up. 
No, I really, really liked your presentation. And thinking about the numbers at the beginning, I have a question. There's strength in numbers. There's marketing strength in numbers, you know, in the commercial arena. There's political strength in numbers. If gay and lesbians were given an opportunity to check off on a census form that they're gay or lesbian, would they? It's yes. kind of a two-edged sword. I know the census haven't worked on it. Yes. It's mandated by law that uh, personal information is confidential for, will not be released for 70 years. So there's great, you know, people can take uh, comfort in the fact that personal information, and it cannot be shared with any other um, uh, department of, of the government. So that's the question. Would people uh, actively check off? It might create a groundswell of, uh, you know, of new statistics that can benefit the community, both in the political and commercial arena. On the other hand, would, or, or would, it, would people feel like it's big brother? Yep. All right, well, I can only speculate, <laughs> and, because we haven't asked that question. Um, but speaking for myself and from the, the folks that I talk, talk with, um, I think it would be overwhelming hand raisers, yes response. On the other hand, um, I know that um, one of the things that, um, that we can see with, with other segments and other niche groups like um, Latino, for instance, there, there will be some where there's a certain amount of fear about privacy or you know, if you live in a small town and you want to identify as gay, you don't know if your male man <laughs> who doesn't know will somehow find out from how you filled out the census. So I think that the, the, um, the hand raisers would far outweigh the closeted folks, and I'd say, yes, 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 let's do it. Can I interject there, Please. too? Please. Um, yeah. Actually, with the recent census, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force um, distributed some pink yeah. stickers yeah. that LGBT people could actually put on the outside of our census forms when we send it in that says, we want to be counted. Yeah. And people did that in droves, and a lot of people took pictures and posted it on their Facebook and all kinds of social media to say, this is what I did, you should do it too, so that we well, I'm glad Sydney brought that up because I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah that that was sort of a, an activist move to say we want to be counted and, and how to do that. So, thanks. Yeah. I have a question here. By the way, thank you. That was uh, very important information. I think uh, uh, effective communications requires understanding of some of those cultural values. And I did not know until today that uh, the way you segmented uh, the uh, gay population. And uh, I was just thinking here, as a marketer, as a business owner, I have a dear friend who happens to be a super gay part of your market segmentation. Yeah. So that's one segment. And yeah. then he's also a male. Yeah. And he's also black. Yeah. And he's also Latino. Yeah. So speaking of multiculturalism, here yeah. we have. So the question is, as a marketer, as a, as a business owner, at what point does one segment of this market becomes more relevant yeah. than other? And which segment do we choose to begin with? We get targeting one of these yeah. uh, market segments. That's a great question and one of the things that we were talking about last night in the, in the VIP reception. Because at some point, you know, we're, we're all a myriad, right? Uh, and we all bring our experiences and our culture uh, to every uh, experience in our decisions. Um, one thing we know, as I mentioned, that the uh, gays and lesbians that we talk to want to see themselves as part of the whole spectrum. So when you, uh, you can sort of deduce that, you know, I can see myself as a woman, as Latina, as lesbian in an ad, I can see that that company supports, you know, all diversity. Um, the other thing that we did notice in, in, in the uh, real world lesbians and gay studies that we did is that for LGBT folks, they identify first by their gender and second by their ethnicity, generally speaking, and then um, by orientation. So we thought that was pretty fascinating. I don't know if that's going to help in the exact marketing that you do, but that might be a good um, question for the panel later on. And Carlos has some. I think that uh, Absolute actually hired a, a gay ad agency specifically for the, to, to market to the general market, yeah. and the other ones didn't have put the shape of the bottle. Yeah. Yep. Yes, they did that. So they didn't do that all in-house. They hired some experts to help them break through. But what was great about Absolute is that since they started, 
Um, they've been completely committed, and year over year, they do more with the community, and it goes, again, beyond giving away products at events and advertising. Um, and, and we find that with other segments as well. If, you, if you're going to start in the marketing era, you can't leave. <laughs> you got to like go all the way in. So the point was that they did all of their campaigns. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Okay. I didn't know that part. Okay. Not just the gay part. Okay. Cool. Because it was so good. We're, yeah. We're, we're going to uh, unfortunately have to move on. You got we, it. We are going to have a Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be at lunch. We, we'll have time to to mingle with our presenters. So how about another hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.